This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 30. I can't believe we've hit 30. It's a landmark episode. I always had 30 episodes in my head as a bit of one of those milestone markers. The next one in my brain is 50, then 75, then 100, but that feels like a really long time away, so I'm not going to think about that. There's something special about episode 30 because it feels like I'm no longer just a beginner, newbie podcaster. I've got 30 episodes. That's a fair amount of episodes. I um, I hear that a lot of podcasts don't make it past 10 episodes. So I feel like, you know, I've done three times that amount. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay, guys. We're doing okay here. In today's episode, I am going to be speaking with Sarah Painter from the Worried Writer podcast. I had the pleasure of meeting Sarah um, at the Edinburgh 20 Books to 50K conference. And we have, I've also been on her podcast and she is just a lovely, lovely human being. We go deep into the psychology of imposter syndrome and self-doubt, and we talk about how to overcome it in order to continue writing and publishing books. But to last week's question, I think I made a boo-boo with last week's question because I asked, what wide marketing tricks do you use? We didn't have as many responses, um, as we normally do. And I think that's because wide marketing is hard and um, there isn't necessarily a right answer as well. So I'm going to rethink about my questions going forward. Uh, One thing I will say is I recently experimented and put my books into Overdrive and Biblioteca and all of the library um, access channels through Draft to Digital. And that has made a stark difference to library sales, like as in uh, many, many more library sales are coming in. Now, there is one caveat to that. We are in a Corona gate still. We are still in lockdown in, what is the date today? The date today is the 10th of May, 2020. Um, And so that will probably be having an effect also because people are reading more digitally and through their libraries because bookstores aren't open. But I highly recommend you try and put your books through DTD just um, not just for that, but for one particular reason is because of their library access. Okay, so this week's question is, how do you battle imposter syndrome and self-doubt? Book recommendation this week is Marketing Rebellion by Mark Schaefer. It's about a different kind of marketing and how, essentially, not to be a cheap car salesman, but introduce the uh, human element of you and your uniqueness and, uh, yeah, into your marketing. And I'm actually listening to the audiobook of that because I am reading some other books, um, Uh, in paper. So yes, I highly recommend it. And it is also narrated by him, which I always like. I am becoming more and more, um, what's the word? I am developing a preference more and more for the author to narrate their audiobooks. I can't tell you why. Um, because obviously uh, audiobook narrators are trained professionals, but I don't listen to fiction uh, in audiobook. So that could also be why I only listen to nonfiction in audiobook. But yeah, I really like when the author narrates their own book. And Oh, and obviously I will leave links in the show notes to his book. On to a personal update. This week was oh, mediocre, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. I feel like I did do loads, but on reflection, I can't really tell you what I did. And I find this happens when I spent too much of the week doing business marketing and admin tasks, you know, the busy work. In my head, I spend a lot of my time measuring the amount of work I am doing by the things that I'm actually creating. So for example, books, obviously, Uh, but also articles, podcasts, um, blog posts, anything that comes from my brain and is a new creation, I, I count that as work. Everything else is just the shit I have to do. 
So when I spend time doing that shit, then everything else feels, well, it just feels like I haven't done anything, even though I have. Anyway, I would love to know how you guys feel about measuring accomplishments and how you do that. So yeah, tweet me or let me know in the comments or whatever you like. The other thing I did achieve this week was finding the missing piece in the lamppost book, aka The Scent of Death. For those that don't know, I can't, I can't remember if I've said this on the podcast, but uh, I walked past a lamppost uh, in my old town and I basically had a whole story and a couple of very particular characters fall into my head, or most of the story anyway. There were missing pieces, uh, but it was, I knew the beginning, I knew the ending, and so that to me is a whole story. I just have to find the way through the uh, darkness and squidgy grey matter of what the fuck. Anyway, I found the missing piece. So I do outline, I do plot, so to speak, but not rigorously. So I have, um, I, I need to know the key points. So I need to know the char the main character's flaw, their um, wo flaw wound. I have to know their strength. I have to know a couple of quirks about them. Um, I have to know their choice. What is the big choice they make in the book? And I have to know the ending. And what happens in creating those things is I tend to see the scenes, I tend to find the scenes, I tend to develop the scenes as I am thinking of these things. And so that then goes into a bit of a clusterfucked mess of an outline and then I just go for it. So I am more or less there now. I am going to write up the outline uh, one more time uh, just so it is in a logical order and then I will be able to work on that but for anybody who is a Eden East uh, young adult fantasy uh, reader of my books, then don't worry, I am going to be finishing Trey first. I have um, started to pull the manuscript back out and look at it and figure out how to get that finished. So yes, I will be working on that. And then probably quarter three, I think I will start writing The Scent of Death. This week I will also be pushing hard on launch work. I have launch emails and articles to write, I've got interviews to prepare for, ads to run and launch graphics to create. So I will be working doubly hard on that this week. But I'll also continue to work on the other collaborative uh, non-fiction book that I am writing and as I just mentioned turning my focus a little bit back to Trey so that when I have finished with all this launch stuff I will be able to focus on finishing finishing that. On not one but two podcasts last week, first a complete fangirl moment, I've personally listened to Stark Reflections by Mark Lefebvre for ages, so it was a real honour to be interviewed by him in episode 133. We talk about the anatomy of being a rebel, which I thought was a wonderful play on words and a nod to both the anatomy of bros and obviously my rebellious nature. So go and check that out and I will add links in the show notes. The second podcast I was on was the Write Your Best book podcast hosted by the lovely Christina Kay. We talk specifically about heroes and how to create the best protagonist you can and I will also include a link in the show notes to that episode which was episode 19. Last up then before we continue, well, I am going to be a guest on Meglator's I Writely YouTube channel this week. We are running a live show together all about how to use the senses in your writing. If you're listening to this in real time uh, on Wednesday the 13th of May, then the show, the live show, is going to be this evening. That will be at 9pm UK time, which I think is 4pm Eastern time, and therefore probably 1pm Pacific time. Don't count me on that. I know it's at 9pm UK time, so uh, just make sure you double check your uh, time buddy clock thingy jobby what's it's that tell you the time in different locations. God, I'm doing well this morning. Don't forget you can get The Anatomy of Prose on pre-order right now. There are just three weeks to go before the launch and you can get it in ebook, paperback and hardback and later in the year you'll be able to listen to my dulcet tones narrating it probably in the fall. 
Okay, listener rebel of the week this week is Alex Corvo. Alex says, my conservative sports oriented high school didn't have a literary magazine. So my friends and I started one publishing our own poems and stories in a photocopied and hand stapled booklet. We were proud of what we'd made and gave copies to our English teachers and our principal. The principal was furious that we dare to bring to school something we'd made in our off hours. He called us into his office one by one and yelled at us, telling us to never, ever do that again. Looking back at it, I think the principal was afraid we might write about the school in the next issue, possibly getting him into trouble with his bosses. But at the time, I didn't understand why students' creative self-expression was being punished instead of celebrated. It's not often that I like to go back in time. Overall, I much prefer being a grown-up to being a kid, but if I could live one day of my life over, I might pick that day my high school principal tried to bully me out of writing. Because if I could go back to that day knowing what I know now, I wouldn't apologise. I wouldn't ask for forgiveness and I certainly wouldn't promise to never do it again. That principal is long gone, fired from his job a few years after I graduated. As for me, I'm happy full. Uh, I'm a happy full-time writer. I'm an indie author, which means no one ever, ever gets to tell me what I can or can't write. Which I love. So this is like a long-term rebellion. Uh, while Alex may not have been able to rebel in um, the childhood, Alex definitely did rebel in adulthood. And huge congratulations for being a full-time indie author and hell yes to the eventual rebellion. I love it. Uh, low on rebel stories again. So if you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your stories. It can be any kind of rebellion and you can email your rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me at rebelauthorpod. Two new patrons this week, Yanni Jade and Angela Guido. I hope that is the correct way to pronounce your name. Um, they both came in at the $5 tier, so they now have access to the private Rebel Author Slack group. I wanted to say an enormous thank you to all of my current patrons, especially in this climate. You help to ensure that this podcast continues and you also make me feel like I am doing something worthwhile that is helping other people. So thank you so much for your support. I really, really do appreciate it. If you would like to support the show and get access to all of the bonus essays, posts and content, you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black and that's Sasha with a C and not an S. Okay, let's get on with Sarah Painter's interview. Hello and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am with Sarah Painter. Sarah is the author of best-selling magical fiction, including The Language of Spells, a book club fiction with atmospheric settings and historical elements for Lake Union, and an exciting new urban fantasy series, Crow Investigations. Yes, she finds it hard to stick to one genre. Sarah also runs a monthly podcast, The Worried Writer, which offers author interviews and tips on how to overcome fear, self-doubt and procrastination. Before writing books, Sarah worked as a freelance magazine journalist, blogger and editor, combining this career with amateur child wrangling, aka motherhood. Sarah lives in rural Scotland with her husband and children. She drinks too much tea, loves the work of Joss Whedon and is the proud owner of a writing shed. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I did not know you have a writing shed. I am so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it is the best thing I have ever ever bought. <laughs> are you are you in your shed now? I am. I am. <gasps> oh my goodness me! It. it looks all professional and office like. Oh, it's fantastic. It was by um, Booth's Garden Studios. Quick shout out to them. Yeah. And I got it done seven years ago, and it still looks as good as the day they installed it. And it's fully insulated. So I mean, I mean in Scotland uh, there is snow outside right now no. and I have a tiny wee heater and it just warms it up and it's brilliant 
Okay, so I, I have a vitally important question <laughs> because uh, we're looking uh, to buy a house this year and uh, my mum's all, oh, save yourself the money, just get a three-bedroom house. And I'm like, I don't want an office in the garden. But um, so the, the, the important question is, are there spiders? Because that is make or break for me. <laughs> no, there aren't spiders because I was worried about that as well. And yeah. that's also why I went a wee bit more upmarket and went for this dedicated um, building with double glazing and all the rest of it. It's not a wooden shed, okay. even though I call it my shed, yeah. <laughs> um, because I was the same. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, I don't have a, an issue with spiders or damp or anything. <gasps> that I is so <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, that is super, super cool. I am kind of secretly jealous. I know another <laughs> author, uh, Joan Dempsey, who has this magical shed in her garden. And it just literally looks like somebody like dumped heaven for writers in her garden. You know? <laughs> well, we definitely did decide uh, we were sort of swithering about whether we should move house because we live in a really tiny wee house. And at the time had two children at home um, and it's three bedrooms rooms and we actually thought for the cost of moving uh, we could get a really nice garden office Mm -hmm. so yeah (laughs) you make very good points oh my mum might win (laughs) hopefully she's not listening (laughs) we'll just go and have a look at some it's just a nice day out go and look at them yeah 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 okay (laughs) right well tell us about your writing journey how have you got to where you are today Okay, everyone needs to make a hot drink, settle in. (laughs) I don't know how far back you want me to go, but um, I was typical, probably, of most authors, always wanted to be a writer, uh, bookworm kid, writing stories for fun, having a great time. And then, I don't know if reality or my perception of reality hit, but somewhere in my teens, self-doubt was a major issue just in general. Um, And I got this idea that writers or authors were basically unicorns. They weren't real people, which meant that it wasn't something you could become because I wasn't a unicorn. So I got this idea that that just wasn't for me, that writers were really clever. Maybe they went to Oxford. They were glamorous. They lived in New York. Um, They were amazingly talented. They were full of ideas. Anything that wasn't me, I thought a writer was. So I quickly shifted and I decided to be dream adjacent. And I thought I want to write, so I will be a magazine journalist because that's an actual job. And um, it seems silly to say, because lots of people were like, oh no, you can't be that either. That's really hard to get into. But to me, it seemed more manageable. Um, So I went to university and then I focused on becoming a magazine journalist and did that for a, a few years. But all the time I wanted to write and I'd write these long angsty journal entries, you know, why aren't I writing and I'd start a chapter and get stuck and then, you know, wouldn't write anything else. And one day I was angsting away and I wrote something like, I think I'm afraid to really try because if I do and there's nothing there, the dream is taken away forever. And it was one of those moments where I realized the truth of what I'd just written And as soon as I recognized that it was this fear that was at the base of it, I knew then that I was going to tackle that. I wasn't going to let that stop me from even trying. And at the same time, um, I read, I was reading everything I could about authors, you know, looking for that magic bullet, Mm -hmm. how they did it. Um, And I I read On Writing by Stephen King, which I know lots of folk recommend. And he described his writing his working day very much in terms of craft you know and his routine he would sit down uh, write his 2000 words and go for a walk in the afternoon recognize that he was going to edit what he'd written later and this focus on work and craft again I read it at the right time uh, I was ready to hear that and I thought well I can work that's one thing I know I can do I might not be very talented I might not have lots of ideas but I can work hard. And that's when I just started to work and write every day and wrote my first book. And then it was just a little matter of, you know, rejection and getting an agent and then getting another agent and, you know, just a few years there (laughs) before I got published. So are you completely traditionally published or are you hybrid or? I'm I'm so happily hybrid. Um, (laughs) So yeah, my first book came out with Karina um, in 20 in 2013 and that was my dream come true getting a trad contract that was all I'd kind of focused on I wanted that stamp of approval again massive self-doubt 
the worried writer very much on brand um, and so for me I just needed that stamp of approval I needed that validation and um, and I got it and I thought this is it now I'm going to feel great but I didn't I still didn't feel like a real writer I still was riddled with self-doubt I was frankly a basket case uh, writing my next book for Karina just about broke me and then there was all the new fears you know what if I don't get another contract what if my editor doesn't like the new book what if my agent can't sell this and it was awful I, I can't overstate how how hard I found it and how it ramped up my anxiety um, and so turning to independent publishing suddenly seeing it as a business um, which is something I did around the time I was published with Lake Union, which was a great experience, but it was still out of my control. Um, and so the moment I started to look at my writing career as a business, everything changed for me. I mean, I've, I've run businesses before. I'm quite, I've been freelance for years. I've only had a proper job for a couple of years. I'm very entrepreneurial. And so when I used that side of me and focused it on my, uh, on my writing, it was amazing control and knowing that what I write is in my control to put out there if I wish to mm -hmm. and the money side oh my goodness I don't think I can afford to be tried published anymore as no. I make so much more money from my independent stuff yeah and I don't think that's an unusual story I've heard a lot of trad writers saying the same thing which is really sad um you know but hey good for us being indie <laughs> absolutely absolutely i'm just grateful that i have I'm, I'm grateful that i have a business mind and that i enjoy that side of it and yeah. um, so that i can take advantage of these amazing opportunities and um, yeah just really grateful yeah no you and me both i i think um I think if you don't have a business mind, it is very hard to be a six, financially successful indie. I think you can still be a successful indie, you can still win awards, you can still be talented, produce books, but if you don't enjoy the business side, it will be difficult to turn it into a full-time career, I think. Absolutely. Um, but okay, let's circle back to um, the fear and uh, the self-doubt. That is why we are here today to talk about... <laughs> My um, favourite subject. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. And actually, it's, it's a topic that is, um, I think, really close to a lot of writers. It's certainly something that I've had to deal with you know, 10 times I've had to deal with it, 10 times the amount in the last nine months having left my job because, um, you know, it's a, the, wow, the fear, the the overwhelm, the anxiety. Um, yeah, increased tenfold when I left my job, which I really wasn't expecting. Um, but but, but let, before we dive into that, uh, tell everybody listening, for those lucky few who haven't really experienced self-doubt or imposter syndrome, also who are these people, but anyway, <laughs> I was <gonna> say that. <laughs> um, you know, there are some, there are some very lucky few, uh, but tell them a little bit about the symptoms and how a writer can recognise it in themselves, because I actually think that's the first step. Often we don't really recognise that that's what we're suffering with. Um, so yeah. Mm, absolutely. Well, I mean, let's take imposter syndrome first, because uh, that's so pervasive. And it's something that initially you can think, well, maybe this is something that I'm feeling because I'm a beginner. Um, but it can hit at any time and it does hit at any time. I've spoken to so many extremely successful authors on my podcast and you know, privately and read interviews and, you know, multi award winning, best selling 30 year career authors still have still suffer with it at times and the, the way it can manifest for example if you're a beginning writer um, or pre-published or however you want to put it uh, imposter syndrome is that little voice that says you're not a unicorn what on earth do you think you're doing <laughs> so you're not a mythical writer so you can't do this and um, even once you're published it's the voice that says that was a fluke you can't do it again. That was sheer luck. Um, or you fooled everyone. They're all going to notice in a minute that actually the book is total shite and they're going to, you know, wake up from their haze dream um, and take away your contract or your royalties or whatever. And again, even if you've written many books, it can crop up and just tell you that um, that you can't do it again, mm -hmm. that you've lost whatever magical talent cloud was above you before and um, and things like that so 
it's also related to comparing yourself to others. It's that idea that there's this mythical place of success where the successful authors live, the real authors live. And of course, every single stage that you get to, any external award, um, reward, I should say, that you achieve, any good review, any publishing contract, any uh, subsidiary right deal, any anything at all, it won't help with your imposter syndrome because you will immediately discount it because it happened to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a really pervasive one. When it comes to self-doubt, I would say that everybody gets self-doubt at some point um, in the process to a greater or lesser extent. But it's incredibly insidious. It hides. So you might not recognize that what you're dealing with is self-doubt. You might think, uh, actually, Sarah, what I'm dealing with here is I'm just lazy because I'm procrastinating all day, every day. I'm a lazy person or I'm lacking discipline. No, nine times out of 10, I guarantee you it's actually fear and self-doubt that is stopping you from achieving what you want to be doing in that time. I think um, I'm I'm like nodding along (laughs) over here because I'm like, oh yeah, shit, that's me, that's me, that's me. (laughs) The The worst bit for me is the, I think possibly I suffer worse with imposter syndrome than I do with self doubt, or at least it starts with imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. which then leads to doubt. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, for example, I have just finished um, The Anatomy of Prose, which is my third non-fiction book, uh, which hopefully will be launched in March, late March 2020. Um, And I... I cannot explain to you the difficulty I had in getting to the end of that book because I was like, well, well, obviously it's shit and (laughs) I haven't got any decent lessons to teach anybody. Everybody already knows this and they're just (laughs) going to find me out and and they're going to realise that I don't know anything and that Mm -hmm. I've fooled them all and that they shouldn't, you know, enjoy my books and I'm not funny and, you know, and it is like these things are so insidious but they're like parasites that like weevil their way through your brain and it doesn't matter what level you are, um, whether it's your first book or your 50th book, it's still there and you know the only yeah I mean I mean on one hand self-doubt to a very 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 tiny degree is helpful you know it's the thing that makes us work hard it's the thing that makes us rework our sentences that could be a wee bit better to get an editor to do a professional job all of that like the tiniest drop but unfortunately, we're flooded with the stuff. Yeah. And we're also the part of the reason we're flooded with the stuff is that our inner critic is basically an idiot. So our inner critic <laughs> is fantastic. It's it's highly honed because we are writers and therefore consumers and lovers of story and books and TV and film. So our critic is finely tuned. It is honed. It's a wonderful instrument for working out what we enjoy and why we like it. It helps us choose the next book we're going to read. But when it comes to our own work, we turn that same functionality onto our own work. And it's an idiot. It cannot tell the difference between our first draft words and the polished, finished, manuscript, published book that we just read and enjoyed. Fundamentally, this is so important. It also can't tell Let me start that again. It also doesn't recognize your own writing voice. Now, voice is the key thing, isn't it? It's what Mm. everyone bangs on about. Mm. Develop your voice, write a million words, get your voice. Voice is what readers come back for. Voice is what makes an editor buy a book. The problem with your voice, Sasha, is that it's your voice. So it's the one in your head, the one that you hear all the bloody time that means it is very dull to you Mm. oh my god oh my god i'm laughing already because i've already said this to my critique partner oh this book is so boring (laughs) now i'm going to give you a top tip the moment you're reading your work and you think it's boring yeah that means you are onto the good stuff because that means you are fully in your voice okay oh interesting it is a really interesting yes that's my big rule of thumb. My other rule of thumb is if you start, if you're writing fiction or nonfiction and you start to feel a wee bit, a tiny wee bit anxious, as if you're maybe exposing yourself a little bit too much, it's maybe a bit dark or a bit scary or a bit 
that's also when you're onto the good stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the boredom one is a big one. Yeah, that's so interesting. And and also um, also the uh, the other side, the anxiety, because I am known for being quite. Uh, how do I put it, like sarcastic and mm. jokes that are quite on the bone, quite, you know, a little mm. bit borderline. And I sort of found myself, so I'm about halfway through the editing and I found myself um, like messaging my first reader going, hmm, is this too, you know, this or is this too that? And I'm not sure, you know, but it is, this is all, this is, oh God, I feel so seen. I feel so seen. Um, I that, I'm just I'm sorry to interrupt no, you there, but fine. it just made me think that this is another key thing is that exactly that, that am I a bit too much? Am I a, a bit too sarky? Am I a bit, is that going to turn people off? And the fact is your book is not a 50 pound note. Not no. everybody is going to like it. No, absolutely. And that is exactly what you want. Yeah. And of course, it's easy for us to say that. We're both nodding at each other. <laughs> yeah. But the fact is recognizing that that brings fear. Mm. That mm. is hard. That fear of judgment. We want everyone to like us. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I just think that recognizing that and recognizing that that, that kind of sucks, that mm. it is a fear, goes a long way to helping us... Um, work anyway <laughs> mm, mm, absolutely and um, um, have I made this up or have you named your critic I have in fact I can show you well I have a little worry dragon which I'm just showing <laughs> Sasha now I've actually bought the embodiment of my worry dragon um so yeah one of my one of my techniques um and before I before I talk about my worry dragon I just want to say that I I use the word anxiety quite a lot um, but I just want to be clear that Sasha and I, obviously today we are talking about um, normal worries that have strong worries, but normal worries. We're not talking medical grade anxiety disorder, totally mm -hmm. different thing. Um, and I also have experience of that, sadly, and it is different. And I really don't want anybody to think that I'm saying, oh, you know, just try a few positive thinking techniques mm, and try yeah. the strategy and you can sort that right out if you've got any concerns about your mental health uh, panic attacks trouble sleeping or just any concerns please please go and see a health professional and because there is help out there and it and it will help yeah absolutely so, absolutely before, um, so just to say but if i am feeling anxious um something that i've done is i've recognized that my self-doubt is a part of me and as such, it's always going to be there. But it's also not all of me. So this is going to sound a bit out there, but I kind of separate it out a wee bit and I talk to it. And to help me do that, I actually envisage it as a cute little critter. And what I envisaged was a little blue dragon, very cute, with a worried expression. And that is my little worry dragon. And what I do is I... I accept that I'm always going to have self-doubt and fear. And part of accepting that was recognizing where it comes from. And of course, it's the thing that we all have. The reason that we are able to be here having this lovely conversation is because we are both descended from a long line of people who were anxious enough to recognize danger mm. and run the flip away from it. Mm. That is why we're here. We are literally bred to be afraid. But here we are, evolution, a bit slow, and our hind brains has no concept that worrying about a negative review is not going to kill us. It equates it all on the same level as walking out into speeding traffic or a lion that's going to eat us. So recognizing that helped me kind of accept and actually feel a wee bit grateful. You know, that's why I have these feelings and mm. that personally helped me come to terms with it a bit it made me feel less weak and stupid frankly it made me think oh there's a purpose to mm. me feeling anxious about sending an email you know and then so what I do then is I chat to my worry dragon and I'll say Stan you know I hear you that's the other thing I spent years pushing it away you know telling myself I was being stupid trying to power on through trying to ignore it did not work so instead, I now say, absolutely, yep, you're feeling a bit anxious about this email or this opening the document today. You know, that's because you're worried you're a bit stuck in it or you're already worrying about your reader's recept you know, reaction to this when it finally goes out. That's okay. Thanks. You know, 
you're looking out for me, but actually this is not a life or death situation. Mm. And this is why. But thank you for loving me and caring for me and wanting to protect me. But you can just stand down for a minute. I physically put my worry dragon in the corner and say, and I'm going to get back to work. I think that's amazing. Uh, when I was a child, I had little um, things called worry dolls, which I think, yeah, were like the same kind of uh, concept. Um Okay, that's amazing. And um, I love that you name it. And I love that it you have literally got it embodied. I think if I were to buy an embodiment of mine, it would be some ugly little troglodyte demon looking ah, thing. No, no Mike, this is another top tip. Though. I'm so glad you said that. The reason I recommend you picture it as something cute. you If you're going to accept that you're always going to have it, why not make it something a bit adorable? I mean, stu- well-meaning, but stupid. Because I'm the queen of villains, darling. <laughs> but at least make it a villain you're, you don't mind having around because it's that thing. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, that's as true. Well, make it something that either makes you smile a wee bit, undercuts it. Yeah, okay. okay. Because it's a villain, but it's not a super villain. Yeah. It's not a clever villain, is it? No, no. Oh. No, it's not because I've managed to get to the end of another book, thank God. um okay so what what other sort of strategies or coping mechanisms like big scale as opposed to the day-to-day that one was of like a day-to-day you know nitty-gritty um what other coping mechanisms are there that that writers can use to you know continue to fulfill their dreams and not get stopped by this bloody awful insidious parasite that is doubt (laughs) well i think i do think that the number one is to recognize it And that gets easier with practice. And it also gets easier with, I find journaling, I find Mm -hmm. writing about stuff useful, because that's how I make sense of how I'm feeling. And I kind of know what I'm thinking when I write it. So a bit of free writing about about what's going on with you. Um, Another thing that's sort of a bit higher level, I guess, is to really concentrate on shifting your focus, um, so that you're not focusing on product, you're focusing on process, Mm -hmm. or to put it another way on practice. So if you spend your whole, if you um, find yourself thinking, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to write 5,000 words this week. Um, that's pro- that's kind of process. It's 5,000 words, but you're likely to be thinking, oh, and it's got to be this and it's got to be good and it's got to be, and it, where it fits in with the final end product, 5,000 words, because that's two chapters, because that's part of this book, that sort of spiraling thing. You want to catch yourself from doing that and you want to say, no, I am going to practice the craft of writer. I'm going to practice as a writer, like as if I'm learning the piano and I'm going to be learning scales. I'm going to be spending time practicing writing. So I am going to write, I mean, you can say 5,000 words if that's how you like to track it. Or you can say, I'm going to spend an hour every day going to make a nice cup of tea I'm going to put on my favorite music I'm going to sit in my favorite spot you're going to make it as pleasant and pleasurable as possible and the focus is entirely on just spending that time doing it it's not on the process at all and that that takes some mental gymnastics particularly if you're already publishing um it it isn't easy But it does work if you keep on catching yourself and reframing it in your mind all the time. And the other thing to do is to reward yourself heavily um, for whenever you have done that, that that bit of, let's say, that 20 minutes of writing or looking at your manuscript or whatever. That's your goal. It's the practice. Then you have to follow through. You have to reward yourself for it, even if you stared at the thing and did did absolutely nothing. You can't then cheat yourself and go yeah but you didn't really do it you have to then genuinely give yourself the biscuit the high five the dance around the kitchen the big tick in your planner whatever it is however you track however you reward you have to do it and you'll feel false and you will not believe yourself but I guarantee if you keep on doing it you will make your writing life something that you want to go towards because it will be full of reward it will be full of stickers and biscuits and high fives Mm. not full of recrimination regret (laughs) negativity i think that's fascinating and um also uh what's the word Uh, reassuring because i have 
accidentally done at least the first half of what you were talking about. So in order, basically last year I got stuck um, writing the third book in my young adult fantasy series. I've written 75,000 words and I just couldn't finish it. Not because I don't know the story. I absolutely know the plot, but um, the doubt monster just ate me and I, you know, I felt like something was wrong. It wasn't good enough. I couldn't get in the habit of sitting down. I I kept failing to meet goals and targets. Mm. And anyway, I listened to a couple of podcasts. Uh, One was, I think, Jay Thorne and the other one was an audio book called Atomic Habits. And um, essentially where I got to was uh, instead of trying to set goals and targets, just put a new system in place. And that completely changed everything. So Mm. I used Nano, uh, even though I didn't, I, from the outset, I said, I am not going to hit 50,000 words. It is not about hitting 50,000 words because I knew if that was a goal, I'd just rebel against it <laughs> and then purposefully fail. So I was like, no, I'm using Nano as you know a habit making tool. Mm-hmm. And um, I rejigged my working day so that I wrote from 8am until lunchtime. And that was it. If I wrote 8 a.m. till lunchtime, it didn't matter what I got. The fact was I was arse in the chair doing the Mm. work, doing, you know, I was doing the doing. And, um, you know, I have to say, I know you mentioned that it is a mindset shift and it it was hard because because I wasn't tracking a word count particularly. I mean, I do track my daily word count, but that wasn't my measure. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really hard because I wasn't necessarily getting the numerical satisfaction that I was getting previously but what I was doing was cementing a habit and lo and behold I got to the end of the book and faster than I thought I was just because I turned up every day and I did it um the thing that I'm absolutely the thing that I'm not good at is rewarding myself um Mm -hmm. yeah I'm terrible terribly Mm -hmm. terrible at rewarding myself I mean I I pretty much I took a bath with a book that was my reward for finishing a book was probably not really enough of a reward but (laughs) no I'm gonna say that's more like a daily I did my time today (laughs) reward not a I finished a book reward um but I mean I mean habits is another thing that I always recommend because again it transformed things for me it's that focusing on the process is part of that is scheduling as you say organizing your day um, or scheduling a block of time uh, when you're going to work on your writing or practice your writing or play Mm -hmm. however you want to frame it and habits again so important little and often is can work really well and but what I was going to say about rewarding is I spent years in using very much the stick approach Mm -hmm. because I thought that I was essentially lazy I thought deep down if I'm totally honest with you I thought that I was a bit crap and a bit lazy and that if I wasn't really strict with myself I would just not get anything done and what turned out to be I resisted uh trying the carrot reward approach very much because it felt very airy fairy and I, I felt honestly like I didn't really deserve it and that it wouldn't work but it does work because we're not idiots, Sasha, Mm. we're not stupid. So if you fill your day with, if you fill your writing day with berating yourself, then event you subconsciously, you're going to start to turn away from that Mm. because it's not pleasant. Mm. It's not fun and you're not an idiot. So you're going to walk away from that. But if you fill it with, positive reinforcement and lots and lots and lots of little rewards and and I really do mean little rewards on a bad day I also mother myself because I mean my kids are practically grown up now but I mother myself or I'm a good boss to myself again depends on how you want to put it but I will chat to myself like okay yeah you didn't sleep very well last night but that's all right so you're going to write in bed you're going to do your writing bit in bed you don't have to get up and go out to the office and put the heater on if you don't want to you're going to have an an extra cup of tea you're going to write in bed you're going to do this and then if you get an hour done then you're going to watch netflix or you're going to have a nap or you can take the rest of the day and magically i actually get loads more done because Mm. I've been nice to myself. And if I don't, and I do have a nap and I do take the rest of the day off, then the following day, I don't wake up in a, uh, with a sort of negative, oh, I failed yesterday. 
Mm. that makes sense oh it makes so much (laughs) sense and I think this is the perpetual lesson I need to keep learning because I'm a bastard to myself to be honest with you I mean I suspect yeah (laughs) yeah like they you know people are hard on themselves and then there's like me who's like an evil wench to myself and I'm just awful and horrible and yeah I know I need to I do need to be I I know that I I know this is one of my uh, downfalls and so I do try to work on it every so often particularly actually the tiredness of late Um, when I was in the day job I was always tired because I would stay up until midnight one o'clock two o'clock writing because I would rather do that and work towards this career than I would have done you know I could cope Mm -hmm. being tired in my day job essentially um but now I can't do that. And so I I have slowly but surely started to do things like go to bed early, which I know that sounds ridiculous, no, but like no. that really is a, you yeah. know, a reward for me because, um, yeah, it is. And mm-hmm. or I'll go and read in bed, you know, for an hour or whatever. So um, <clears throat> and have you got yeah. a start time and an end time to your day and a lunch break and all of that? <laughs> a lunch break? Gently? yeah no 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 I I like I said work in progress yeah I am no I'm terrible and um usually my wife has to be like yo uh Sasha we have not had an evening together in like two weeks and I'm like oh haven't we haven't we and I'm like oh yeah that's why I'm so fucking tired um you know because I will put my son to bed and then work until my eyes bleed or they roll out of my face or I pass out on my computer um yes and lunch breaks Mm. it's it would it would help if I ate lunch you know quite often I forget Mm. to eat lunch because I'm so Mm. engrossed I'm so engrossed in my work I have had to set an alarm on my phone to remind me to leave my house to pick up my son from school because I will just I will just like tunnel vision focus that's fantastic yeah that is one thing yeah (laughs) yeah exactly Um. um yeah yeah. Um, okay. Why? Uh, why do you think that writers suffer so much, or, or I guess creatives? Why do you think it's you know creatives that suffer so badly with this kind of doubt and? Well, I think that it's partly because working in a creative uh, industry, it's it's so subjective, isn't it? There is no kind of agreed upon standard of what is a good book or what's literary merit. There are no like defined parameters um, or a defined career path um, so that that brings in an awful lot of uncertainty and um, so I think that that's a factor I also think that um, writing is essentially scary or mm-hmm. releasing our writing into the world is essentially scary because even though you know we might not be writing an autobiographical book it's from our brain it's from our soul. It's from our. It's a mulched down version of our experiences. It's our view on the world. It cannot help but reveal a wee tiny bit of us. Mm. And then we take that and we put it out in the world and say, "Please judge this." <laughs> yeah. And that is just inherently terrifying. And I think recognizing that, acknowledging that, really helps. Um. Acknowledging the fact that that is why a lot of folk never finish a book, even though they want to and are wonderfully talented and have a wonderful story inside them. They'll never finish it because the fear of finishing and then being read, of being seen, of maybe that failing or them being embarrassed or any of those things, that stops them. And even people who have had a publishing career of that can, it can stop them at any time because it is really scary. Mm. So I think partly, I think that's a big factor. Um, and I think another reason is the sort of judgment thing. I think a lot of, I mean, I do this. I have definitely done this, but I have now, I curate, that's not the right word. I curate, <laughs> that's the word. I curate what I allow into my headspace. Um, so I think if you allow yourself in, in the industry, it can, it's very easy to get that sort of scarcity mindset that there are only, you know, the sky is falling, people aren't reading as much, or there's only so many readers to go around and book sales. And, and it's very easy to get very, very panicked and to feel as if there's a scarcity 
to what we do. Um, so I, I try and concentrate and follow and read um, positive people, positive groups. I avoid reading my reviews. That's a big one. Um, I realized very early on that I'm just not able for it. I mm. cannot write and read reviews of my work. I just can't do it. Um, a good review is nothing to, not nothing, I'm grateful, but it doesn't snag. Whereas a bad review it could send me into a tailspin for days or it will just be there. Um, so it's about protecting your headspace, protecting where you do your work and only allowing in stuff that's actually helpful, positive. Um, oh, I got I got off on a tangent there. Sorry, that wasn't really the question, was it? No, it's fine. I um, <clears throat> Excuse me, the things that you were saying about reviews, it's really interesting because obviously we all need reviews, um, but I have had to wean myself off reading reviews as well because it doesn't really matter if they're positive or negative. They both send me spiralling. So I will read a positive review and be like, oh no no they're mistaken or oh it was only about that particular chapter and yes. the rest of it was shit or you yeah. know oh I'm gonna get found out you know my next yeah. book's not they're not oh, they're gonna, gonna hate that. the next one because they like this about this book and yeah. it's not really like that in the next one so yeah. they're not gonna like the next one I'm gonna yeah. let them down <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah. I completely agree about the reviews mm. um Okay, a slightly different topic, uh, but which I do think is related to self-doubt. And this one is from a patron. So thank you very much to Holly for the question. She says, do you suffer from from self-sabotage? And if so, how do you combat it? Well, that's that's a really great question. And um, the answer is that I'm going to touch wood as I say this because otherwise I'm jinxing myself terribly. Um, But I don't suffer with it as badly as I used to. But I used to suffer with it, I mean, completely. I mean, to the point that I did not write. I didn't write a book until my late 20s, even though it was the only thing I'd ever wanted to do. That was complete self-sabotage. And so I think the first thing I would say is that recognizing that that's what you're doing is key um so again as we we've, we've already touched on it's don't immediately say oh i've i you know i've i didn't get that thing done i didn't start that book today i didn't write that chapter i didn't work on my writing today i'm a failure i'm lazy i'm i procrastinated i can't do it go beyond that what's really going on and this counts for me say with marketing stuff these days i'll that's where i'll sometimes self sabotage now i'll notice that uh, I've got something on my to-do list and it just keeps skipping. I keep on having to write it down and write it down and write it down. And I will now notice that I'm doing that. And rather than beating myself up and saying, well, you're just crap, look look at that. Um, I'll say, hang on a minute. Okay, Sarah, what's going on? Why is that moving along? Mm. Now, it could be that actually it's not that important to me and I can just cross it off the to-do list it's no longer relevant I've actually decided I don't really want to do it it's not a priority away it goes or it could be that I'll recognize by a little dialogue with myself chatting to myself or writing it down I'll realize that yeah I'm feeling a wee bit nervous about posting on my Facebook author page because I'm aware I haven't for a bit so that makes me nervous it's almost like stage fright um so then I will counteract it to answer your question. I will get around it by looking at the specific reason, the specific fear that's going on. And then I will come up with a plan for what I want to do and break it down to the tiniest, tiniest, most manageable steps. Now, with a scary email, I will draft the email and that's a step. I'm not sending it. I'm just drafting it. Um, with working on my book, it could be, a smaller step is I'm going to open the document. That's it. That's the step. And then, as I said earlier, you have to then genuinely reward yourself because you did the step. Mm. So break it down into the tiniest, most manageable steps. Write them all down or, or get them fixed in your mind and then just work through the steps with rewards after each one. And that's kind of how I get around it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And um, I think it's so true. And also with the systems, again, I think putting in the systems, that is because I would have self-sabotaged. I mean, let's be real here. What I did with the third book in my young young adult fantasy series, which still isn't finished, is self-sabotage. And that's mm-hmm. why it's not finished. And I think if I hadn't have put in a new system in place, 
uh, for the anatomy of prose and I wouldn't have got to the end of that book either um you know it, it had been it's been over a year since I published and I can 100% attribute that to uh, well okay 90% attribute it to fear and 10% because I transitioned and left my job and it was crazy yeah, absolutely um but yeah I think when you have a system in place um with rewards you you there is no self-sabotage because the, you, all you have is the system and mm-hmm. you show up and you you just do the doing and it in a weird way it sort of prevents any sabotage because it's routine and habit and and once it becomes unconscious um you know really embedded and automatic then you know it it does stop that um but absolutely i think i think you're absolutely right i think the routine um is is so is so important and as you say that sort of routine and embedding it in the habit but uh, another thing is that recognizing okay there are things that happen in life like mm-hmm. leaving your job sasha mm-hmm. <laughs> fair enough that that comes with a, an adjustment or there can be stuff that goes on illness grief uh moving house stresses in life so first off i would say um to was it Holly? Sorry to Holly. Mm. I would say, check, is it self-sabotage? Mm. Just check. Now, 90% of the time it is, <laughs> you know, it is. But of course, some of the time it isn't. So just check, are you being a wee bit hard on yourself? Mm. What is going on? Because if there is something, if you want to write, and I'm going to assume it's writing that we're talking about here, if you want to write and it's not happening, there is a chance that there is an external or health or something factor that is stopping you. Mm. So recognize that first. Then when you've checked it's not that, given yourself a break, because this stuff goes on in our heads. We're not digging ditches. You can't always just power through it and that's okay. Mm. Be kind to yourself. But when you've rec- when you've worked out that, no, actually it is self-sabotage, the really important word in there, ultimately, and this is a wee bit tough love, is self. Nobody else is doing that to you. So nobody else can fix it. Yeah. And you have to decide whether you pick up habits, whether you try a reward sticker system, whatever you try, or probably a multiple of things, it's up to you. And only you can decide if you want this enough. And again, do some thinking. What is it you want? Why do you want it? And are you willing to face the fear that every single author you have ever loved and love now faces every day because mm. that's what it comes down to there's nothing wrong with you it doesn't mean you're not cut out for it it just means you're a creative person trying to do a basically terrifying thing <laughs> absolutely um and i love the fact that you talked about um the other factors katie forrest has written a book called time management for writers and she talks about crises like life crises and mm. how often um we you know, and by life crises, I mean a parent gets sick or a child is injured or, um, you know, wh- whatever, you know, your car explodes and you have no way of getting to work anymore. Um, you know, and she talks about how so many of us expect ourselves to just continue delivering the mm-hmm. same amount of work in, in those circumstances. And that's just impossible because you have a crisis and that is the yeah. point of the word crisis. Um, you know, and it's, and it's uh, about recommend, rec- recommending, recognizing mm-hmm. um, that. Okay. Last couple of questions then. Uh, any book recommendations or resources that you would um, recommend on the topic? Obviously, your podcast. Let's mention that first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you want a free podcast yeah. all about self doubt and procrastination, there's that um, goes out on the first of every month. Um, also, What's some books that I've found called. Partic- Oh, sorry, The Worried Writer. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's useful, isn't it? Yeah. The Worried Writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can head to worriedwriter.com. Um, and also in terms of books that I've enjoyed, uh, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, I found very good. Mm. Uh, years and years ago, I read The Courage to Write by Ralph Keyes, and I found that really useful. Um, books on habits, again, I haven't read the one that you mentioned, but... Um, I think I've read a different one, which was also very good. I can't remember the name, I'm afraid. Um, And of course, I will plug my own book, uh, Stop Worrying, Start Writing, How to Overcome Fear, Self-Doubt and Procrastination. (laughs) Amazing. Um, And I will make sure there are links to all of those in the show notes. Um, 
Okay, my favourite question of the podcast. <laughs> this is I'm the rebel. I'm terrified by this question. I, literally everybody says that to me. Like, everybody is like, how am I? I'm not a rebel. I'm like, but aren't you? Aren't you? I think <laughs> you <laughs> are. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell us about a time that you unleashed your inner rebel. <laughs> well, yes. No, like everybody else, I am very much not a rebel. The rules control the fun. <laughs> so I am very much a rule follower. Um, but I was thinking about this question this morning, and I honestly think that writing and publishing is the most rebellious thing that I do. And for me, uh, going hybrid felt pretty rebellious because it was turning away from a path that I had wanted and aimed for my whole life uh, to seeing a different way. So that felt pretty rebellious. Um and I think also from the self-doubt point of view, I can't quite believe that the insecure, worry-ridden person that is me is able, rebellious enough, if you like, to take the silly stories that I have in my head and put them out into the world. I mean, that feels like a massive act of rebellion to me because it rebels against that self-doubt that wants to shut me up. I love that. And I think that is the most, I think that is one of the best truth, truthful, most vulnerable, but brilliant rebellions there is, because I also have to rebel against my um, inner asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and your podcast and, and all of that jazz and your social medias and all of those things. Okay, so I'm I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have an author page, uh, Sarah Painter Books. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at Sarah R Painter. Uh, you can go to worriedwriter.com or find that on podcast catchers. Um, or for my fiction, it's sarah-painter.com, and that's where you can find my urban fantasy and magical realism and all of that stuff. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Uh, thank you to all of the patrons who are supporting the show if you would like to get early access to all of the episodes you can do so by going to www.patreon.com forward slash sasha black and that's sasha with a c thank you to everybody listening i'm sasha black you were listening to sarah painter and this was the rebel author podcast next week i will be speaking to derek murphy he is oh my goodness me his brain is enormous he is full of amazing creative innovative ideas and you will hear me uh, squealing with joy about how many things i need to go away and do after next week's podcast we are speaking about reader funnels how to create them the content you should to put in them and how to brand them. So join me next week and don't forget the question of the week this week is how do you deal with imposter syndrome and self-doubt? And don't forget you can still get your pre-order copy of The Anatomy of Prose uh, in ebook, hardback and paperback. And when you do, you will also be getting a self-editing checklist, uh, prose check, pro-specific checklist, and also a additional download with the book once the book is released, of course. Okay, that's it for this week, and I will see you next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Music.